Welcome to Picks with the Professor, the show where a real statistics professor gives you sports betting picks. This is college basketball, March Madness, first round of the 2024 NCAA tournament, Thursday games. We'll have another show covering the Friday games, 14 games to discuss. There are two that are involving the playing games, and we're recording this show early enough to get this content out there for you that we don't know who that will be. There are no lines yet. We cannot talk about those. But those picks and projections, along with the NIT, CBI, and CIT, are all over on Dub Club, where you can get projections, details, all sorts of insights, summaries, anything you can ask for, details about the team, ratings of the teams, pace metrics, all that on Dub Club. You can sign up. With that QR code right there, the link in the show description, and get a bunch of extra stuff. But otherwise, Jake, in case someone's new with us, just wanted to catch them up on the recap slide. Our plays of the day did really well. And what we have tried to do for this tournament is, is make everything a play of the day. Yeah. Obviously, it was a little bit more difficult than that because we're making a pick on every single game. But trying to highlight what we like the most so it's like play of the day light uh, uh for all these games we'll go through and talk about which ones we like the most which ones we're kind of saying this is what we're choosing but we don't love it we'll try to talk about that uh, but even though it was only small positive we had a lot of positives here this college basketball season uh jake and we're looking to carry it forward uh finishing up march madness with this the biggest of the four tournaments in postseason play. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, this is what we live for. It is the single best sporting event of the year. It yep. doesn't matter what you do because I mean the Super Bowl is one night that doesn't doesn't hold a candle to this. Like it's yeah. so much fun. And I mean the fact that we're seeing all that green on the screen is incredible because college basketball is notoriously hard to cap size totals, whatever way you want to do it. And seeing all that green is very impressive. Yeah, it's been a, it's been another good year for us here. And of course, we've got baseball coming up soon. The first two games will be starting. I think the first game, first pitch is in like 40 hours from now from this recording. By the time you're watching this, depending on if you're with us on Dub Club, you get the early access to all this stuff. So with us on Dub Club, you're still a little bit ways away. But if you're watching this on YouTube, um, uh, without that, you know, the early access link, uh, the first pitch may be, you know, minutes away from from when you're watching it uh, or mere hours away. And baseball last year, our plays of the day on that, uh, you know, another, uh, you know, three-ish percent ROI. The A grades were positive again there, uh, just like they seem to be for every single sport, which is uh, the goal that the A grades are, are plays that you can trust. And they have ups and downs. Uh, the A grade totals uh, did not finish as strong as we would have hoped. There are always ups and downs. There's just nothing we can do about it. it, it, it it's a little tragic when it finishes the, the regular season more mediocre, but the, the bottom line is that the totality of them uh, is what we focus on. We focus on the long run here, and we have a lot of games to cover here today, a lot of long run that we get to play here, at least for Thursday, Friday. After the first weekend, it'll get a little bit of a smaller sample size, but early on we have – a bunch to talk about but first before we do that remember always shop around for the best price one of the places you can do that is bet us 125 percent deposit on your first three deposits also a little bit of gambler's insurance if you're losing money they'll give you a little bit of it back at the end of every month no reason not to check them out that sign up link is in the show description Bet US, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. Jake, we'll start off here at 12.15 Eastern. The Battle of MSU, Michigan State and Mississippi State. I don't know what to make of this game. Both of these teams have had stretches and games where they look great and stretches where they look terrible. Uh, this is an 8-9 matchup that is going to be the solo game for the first half hour of our Thursday mm -hmm. afternoon, or if you're not in the Eastern time zone, morning. Jake, we're going to be the under here, under 130, models 129. 
I just like going under in these early games if I can. The model does not have any time variable to it. Maybe it should. It's one of the things I have on my to-do list in this offseason is to go back and look at throughout the data and see, is there any overall trend towards unders earlier in the day, whether it be on Saturday or Sunday or during the week? Uh, but we always talk about unders early on in the tournament here. Uh, first half unders, which used to be a cash cow until the sports book started really shading those first half numbers down. It was, a, it was unfortunate. It was. There was a few years back where we were just cashing those left and right, and it was a lot of fun. Now it's a lot tougher to do that. But in general, the under is still kind of a good look early on. First game, new gym. Uh, early sleepy star and a Michigan State team that just has no desire to push the game and a Mississippi State team that I don't know, Jake. You 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 know watch more SEC basketball than I do. I kind of catch a little bit of everything. Mississippi State to me struck me as a team that if you wanted to play fast, they'd go fast with you, and if you wanted to play slow, they'd go slow with you. They were really kind of just didn't drive the tempo didn't really care and so to me this seems like a game that's going to shift more towards michigan state's pace that's kind of why i like the under in this one and why i think it might be worth an investment on top of that both defenses are much better than both offenses so if there is going to be a real sleepy early game that's you know 55 to 51 or something that makes you think you're back in college basketball from several years ago this seems like the perfect setup what's your take on it jake yeah like I think Mississippi State kind of pivoted towards uh, more defense towards in, in the conference tournament rather than offense. They kind of let uh, – I mean, the emergence of Josh Hubbard really – they were trying to let him cook, and it didn't go too well as a team. He was doing great. It was just as a team. And when your best player, your most talented player is Tolu Smith, you've got to slow that down because he's a big physical guy. And – that's that's how they're going to attack Michigan State because that's who they've struggled with all your big physical teams. Uh, I mean, like Duke and Arizona got them early in the year. Wisconsin even with that wall and all that. Purdue was tough on them with Edie. I mean, he's been tough on any everybody. I mean, Zed Key, who – what is it with these Ohio State guys and pay, playing for 90 years between uh, – What's his face? Greg, Greg Oden. <laughs> yeah, Greg Oden. And then you got oh, Zed Key, who's been around forever. Like, Michigan State struggled with them. It's like they struggle with these big physical big guys. Uh, and DJ Jeffries puts matches up with Malik Hall, like pound for pound, inch for inch. And I, w- I would think DJ Jeffries is one of the better on ball defenders out there. That, so that's going to take a big weapon out of because they put him on whoever is the best offensive player or whoever's hot and he kind of shuts them down and he does a lot more than what his uh, points per game kind of looks like his box score doesn't show up a lot, but he is a very important player. I'm not sure uh, Michigan state's got a counter for him. And I think Mississippi state's going to be able to control this game and they're going to want to play slow. Michigan state wants to play slow and depend on their defense should be a terrible way to start a great tournament. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Uh, Jake, I'm going to put you on the spot here on a couple of these uh, coin toss games where we take a total. Oh, Sideline says Michigan State wins 54% of the time. So a slightly in the books are kind of in the same boat. They've got Michigan State by one. Uh, so I, I think Sideline and the books are, are just in lockstep with us on the side, at least as of right now. I don't know where the number will move by the time you watch this. And if you shop around, you can get better or worse prices on either side, of course. Uh, Jake, I'm going to put you on the spot, though. Michigan State, Mississippi State, both teams are – are solid, have a lot of upside, have a lot of times where they don't show up. Who shows up? Who wins this one? Uh, what's your projection? I like Mississippi State. Like it, If you look back to all the way back to January on Michigan State, the teams they beat were Michigan, Maryland, somehow got Illinois at home, beat Penn State, Michigan again, Northwestern, and Minnesota. Those are not powerhouse teams, even in the even in a week Big Ten besides Illinois. So they got Illinois once. They're just – I don't think they're playing well. Don't really think they should have got into the tournament. I thought they should have been a play-in kind of game uh, if they made it. So this is – I think Mississippi State earned their spot, and I think they're going to flex on them a little bit here. All right. Yeah, models, you know, fairly high on Michigan State. Uh, has them number 17. Oh, they've got the talent. They've got the yeah, talent, they've it, got the coach. Yeah. It's just not come together this year. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you never know with Izzo, right? There's probably people watching this who are you are just, you know, obviously he's got all the accolades in the world. But then there's also, yeah. uh, you know, when you coach that long, you, you you have plenty of times your team struggles in March and plenty of times your team succeeds in it. So a lot of narratives out there uh, about 
uh, you know, Tom Izzo and, and, and his Spartans that of course they've had a lot of great runs. Um, I think that one will be, uh, like you said, a, a close game, an interesting game, maybe not the most exciting game um, with regards to the number of points. So we're going to be in the end there, there to start uh, Duquesne and BYU will be the next game going uh, sidelines got BYU favored by eight right now. I'm seeing eight and a half. So another game where the spreads priced pretty well, the totals priced pretty well too. model says 141. We went under 140.5. One of the weaker picks we've given out here. Uh, but Jake, the, I, I like this one and, and, We'll try to couch them and talk about, you know, hey, this one we don't really love or this one we like and why. I, I like this under, even though the model's not really a big fan of this one. You know, we watch a lot of college basketball throughout the year. And by this point of the season, we also, we talk a lot with Cousin Jared about kind of how we know the model and we know its strengths and its weaknesses and its biases. And, and no models are perfect. No models are, are, are right. You know, they're all wrong. And we always say, you know, some are useful, uh, but they're all off by a little bit and, and, and in different ways. We've been going over a lot on these BYU totals. And so even though it's only a D grade and it's really not much of an edge at all, I was fully expecting sideline to say over in this game. But we've got some overs uh, that the model has told us uh, on this one, even though if they're not the strongest of plays. But we've got some overs here. And I just really thought with BYU – the way the model likes BYU over it with this. The fact that it says under, I kind of think that's a decent look. This BYU team has a great offense, but Duquesne's defense is really good. They slow the game down. BYU doesn't really control the pace. If you slow them down, they will go slower with you. If you want to go fast, they love to run and gun, but they have no problem slowing it down. And this BYU offense, Jake, how many times have we seen them look fantastic for 10 minutes and then disappear for a complete half. If they disappear for a bit, the cover is going to be in question, which it was in many of their games in the regular season. And the over is not going to stand a chance. Uh, if that same sort of thing happens here, high possibility of it happening in a neutral site in a new gym as well. What are, what is your take on this under? It's one of my, of the, of the ones where we are really scraping the bottom with like D grade picks. This would probably be my favorite. Like this is Duquesne is did had a terrible start to the year, especially in conference. I think they dropped their first five in a row, um, and then but they ended on a, a very hot streak with like with including the tournament, like, what eight in a row, something like that. Uh, only one of those games approached this number. Like they are, I know they didn't play any team with the offensive powerhouse, but they also kept games right around 100 points, like 130 being the top end. Like it, th if they control the pace, which BYU seems to let other teams control the pace, this game will be played in the 120s. Yeah. And I think that's bad news for BYU. I mean, we saw BYU's offense go against UCF, who plays slow, good defense, and they torched them in the first game of the tournament, of the Big 12 tournament. And then the next game, it just wasn't there. The offense just wasn't there. It got blown out by Texas Tech. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see a blowout. I think it'll be a tight game. But I, I think if Duquesne's all in control of this pace, it's going to be a very creepy, crawly pace. And it's going to take some mental fortitude for BYU to hold on and win this game, which that I'm not sure that they have. Yeah, and of course we talk about – we'll talk about Tech later on as they made the tournament uh, as well. I don't know if they're uh, – I guess we'll talk about them uh, well, later in this show. Um, mm -hmm. we'll be covering that game, but, uh, you know, tech in that game just hit really well from three. And that's been BYU's downfall sometimes too, has been their defense. It's not that their defense is bad, but their defense just gets beat up by some teams that are sometimes really efficient. That tech offense doesn't really pay play at a fast pace, but they can be really efficient. They can really hit their threes. They can shoot well, they can score. And you look at Duquesne and that's not their strength is the scoring. Their strength is that defense. And so I don't really think Duquesne's going to score a ton on BYU. I think they're going to, you know, make it, you know, more of a measured game or whatever and slow it down and, and grind it out. And that's, what's going to potentially keep this game uh, close, at least for a while. We'll see how it finishes if BYU can get outside the number or not. But uh, a number of, times we were frustrated by laying a number with them and they were well outside the number and then just stopped playing offensively or against tech in that case they kind of just didn't really show up offensively in the first half and so any any offensive lull like that from BYU is going to make 141 and a half a pretty tall number for a tournament game which are usually lower scoring 
here, especially in neutral courts. 1.30 p.m. Eastern, Akron and Creighton. Uh, Jake, you can see it on screen there. This is one of the biggest mismatches of the first round. So I think it's Akron like 119th, Creighton number nine. This is just a big mismatch. There's really no other way to put it. B grade pick on Creighton laying 12 and a half. As the model says, it's an average of Creighton by 17. Jake, the other way you can play this is by playing the under. I don't think the under is a bad pick. It's just that it's hard to see Creighton with that really efficient offense and that really good defense not just having their way with Akron. So I think laying it with Creighton here is the strongest bet in this game. What's your take? Yeah, um, Creighton, is this is one of my favorite plays because Akron doesn't deserve to be there. They know they don't deserve to be there. And they even – like besides the three games that – or the two games they won in the tournament, the one that was gifted to them – Coming into the, the last, they got beat by Ohio, beat Northern Illinois, then lost to Eastern and Western Michigan. Like, it, they're not playing, they weren't playing well. They don't really deserve to be there. Creighton is a very deadly team. Uh, I know they got beat by Providence at the tournament in the first round, but that's a different, totally different ball game. This offense they have is deadly. Um, anytime they've played teams that are like, week like this they've absolutely had their way because they've got a very solid defense and that offense is so efficient that they're going slow and they're they're not forcing pace they just good like when you have guys like Tyler, uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner and Baylor Shireman and Trey Alexander it, it's tough it, I don't know what Akron's planning on doing with them and then if Ashworth keeps go, gets hot I mean Creighton could hook, hang a crazy number here, and it wouldn't be surprising to me. Yeah, models got this in the kind of like 80 to 60 type range, uh, which seems about right. Uh, the fact that this is only 12 and a half, I think is giving a little bit too much respect to Akron. We kind of talked about this a little bit on the bracket show that I think right now the perception is that the MAC is stronger than it really is because it's been stronger in previous years. That's why Akron seeded where they are getting a little bit of respect. But I just hope they're quite as strong as some of those previous MAC teams that we've seen in the tournament do some damage and cause some problems. I just don't think they're going to give Creighton much of a problem there uh, to a game that you might see a little bit of a problem Long Beach State in Arizona. And I say that simply because we've talked a lot recently about Arizona and just being confused about what they are, what they're doing, if they're showing up or not, they look great and then they look terrible and you just never know. They obviously went out early last year. That's on their minds again this year uh, as another 215. So, so obviously, you know, they know they can't take Long Beach too lightly. This is an interesting game because Long Beach wants to play fast and Arizona typically plays fast. But if you've noticed in the last month or so, Arizona really has flipped the switch and started playing a little bit slower. That pace has dropped out of the top 10 and then down to number 13. And if you were to weight it based off of recent results, it probably would be more around 25 or so where Long Beach is. There will be points in this game, absolutely. And if these offenses get hot, there's a reason this number is so high. But the model's been pretty strong on these Arizona overs. It's flipped to an under here, 161. That caught my eye because I don't think we've played a single under in Arizona games all season. And knowing the defensive intensity that they've been playing with as of late, and it's not just been a one-game effort. It's been multiple games here. I think this under is worth a look. On top of that, when you look at this, uh, the model rankings, it actually thinks their defense is better than their offense. And that might be due in part because of the offensive dis offense disappearing at times of late, at least relative to what we expected of them. Obviously, Arizona is a much better team than Long Beach, Long Beach State. Uh, but that offense can be inconsistent. That defense, though, if they play with that intensity, slow it down any bit whatsoever, it's going to make it difficult for Long Beach State to score. And Long Beach State's chances of hanging in are going to be more in a low-scoring game. That's how Oregon beat Arizona. So there's no reason to think that it can't happen. U USC beat them in the game also that went under. So, you know, I think Long Beach State, all that to say, I think Long Beach State – would be pretty foolish if they tried to push Arizona to play even faster because I don't think they want to get into a track meet. I know that's not what Long Beach State does, but that seems like the wrong way to play. We're going to go under here, under, under 161. Jake, what's your thoughts? Yeah, like Long Beach State, I'm happy for them. It's a fun story with the coach and all that. Glad you made it. Thanks for coming, kind of deal, because everything they do is what Arizona wants to do. Right, like, and so it's not going to be a pretty matchup for them. 
and a great way how you normally get cheap points to push these things over when it gets over these like these big numbers like you're seeing that's put on this one are threes which Long Beach State is one of the worst three point shooting teams out there and they don't shoot hardly any uh, they rank like 300 in the 303rd three point percentage and they shoot and they rank 347 at three point attempts like it's it's not they're just not going to get a lot of points there they're right about 70 in the free throw percentage so you're not going to get a lot of free easy cheap cheap end points and i mean arizona is not a great three point shooting team either if it's if, especially with as many shots as uh, Caleb Love likes to take he, and some of the crazy ones. If he's off, they, they're going to struggle to put up the kind of numbers they need to get over this number because um, they're really good inside. It's from deep where they struggle, and they're a bit worse th- uh, free throw shooting team than Long Beach, Long Beach State, so I don't think we're going to get a lot of cheap, easy buckets that are cheap, easy points that are going to push this over. The part that worries me is – on this one, and this is why it's probably a C pick, is the offensive glass. Like, I don't know how Long Beach State's going to keep Arizona from not shooting till they hit. We just got to hope that it takes three, four, five, six chances instead of one and two. Arizona on the season went under as many times as they went over, including under in their last three and six of their last eight, uh, which kind of goes to that point I was talking about, bringing a little bit more defensive intensity, playing a little bit more measured. I wonder if that has to do with last year, the fact that they lost, if they decided that they wanted to maybe have a slightly different approach coming in the tournament, maybe play a little bit of a different style. I'm not really sure the specifics on that. Just notice that we've seen a little bit of a difference than playing USC was a situation that with the way USC plays should have been way more points than the war and didn't even sniff the over. Uh, and so a lot of these Arizona unders, it's not that they're going under because they're playing games in the 65 to 55 range. They're going under because the number is in the 160s and it doesn't and it, it doesn't take much for a game, especially in early afternoon. This is out on the West Coast, so this will be local time, you know, I, I believe an 11 a.m. tip uh, at this one because it's, you know, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um and they're playing out in uh, well, where where are they at here? Uh, oh, they're in Utah. So uh, yeah. I don't know what time zone is Utah in. Utah's in mountains, so I guess there'll be a noon Eastern start or noon, noon Mountain Time start, noon local time. Uh, but it, you know that's an early tip, new you know new gym that sort of thing, and uh, it, you know a lot of ways it can go under just because the number's so high. This is not a situation where we'd be going under you know, 155, that seems like a much more reasonable number. But to your point, the part of the reason it's C grade is, is just the fact the number, you know, is, is it even higher? If, if, if Arizona had played a few more overs, maybe towards the end of the season, maybe this number would be a 163, 164. And then at that point, we like the under a little bit more just because we have more wiggle room. Uh, but in this case, just a little bit of an edge, but I, I definitely one I think is worth, uh, worth your investment. Do you, do you think this is one that would be smart? Like if y'all are in Dub Club and already have this to wait on and see if it gets put up because everybody like the offense is what's going to sell. Everybody's going to talk about the offense from Arizona and how fast they are and how they score. And a guy like Caleb Love, Caleb Love, is this something you think would be smart to wait and see if it gets, or do you think it'll get played down? I think it's probably going to get played down at the very end. I think it might get played up throughout the week. My recommendation on something like this with a relatively small edge is put maybe a half unit on the under as it is now and then see if the number goes up. And if the number goes up any, then you can add a half unit. If it doesn't, then just leave it as it is. It's not the biggest edge, but it's worth a little bit of a play. Uh, So kind of a a cut your losses situation, play, play in the middle. Um, North Carolina will be playing at 245 Eastern against TBD. We do not know at this point if it will be Wagner or Howard. And so because we don't know, we cannot talk about that one, but we can talk about Moorhead State and Illinois. Obviously, Illinois is the much better team and they should win this game. The question is by how much or is there going to be a crazy upset? And obviously there will be some upsets. It's hard to know which ones ahead of time. That's what makes it fun. But we're going to play the over in this one. First over here of the regular tournament. We do have one of the overs for the first four. Uh, but we're going to go over 148. Secret pick model says 150. Moorhead wants to play slow. Illinois wants to play fast. That offense 
offensive efficiency for Illinois is through the roof. And you saw it at times in the Big Ten tournament with Illinois just playing in these really high-scoring games. They should be able to control the pace of this. When we talk about if there's a talent discrepancy, the better team tends to control the pace. And so we think that they're going to get up, score points, force Moorhead to play with them. And if Moorhead wants to keep it close, it's going to be because they score points. And if not, Illinois if they run away with it, has a chance to put up 100. There's usually one game that flirts with it here in the early slate. And this, obviously, North Carolina would be one as well. But if it's not for North Carolina, uh, this might be one of the ones that stands a good chance for that to happen. If it's a runaway, if not, it should be a high-scoring, fun game. Jake, what's your take on this game? Yeah, I think there's going to be all sorts of points in this uh, in this game, I mean, Morehead State's not got the guys to, they need to control the pace. Illinois will control the pace for most of the game. It's going to be faster. I mean, Lord, half their games in the month of March, they've put just court above 90 points in. It's not going to be hard for them to get 80, 85 in this one. And we don't, at that point, you don't need too much out of Morehead to go over. Like, it's, I think we've got a, kind of a big mismatch here that Illinois is going to be able to flex on them. And it's going to be fun to watch Darren Shannon Jr. and Damas really handle business. Because Morehead State's got one guy, Riley Minks, or Minks, or however you say his name, that's a very good player. But they are going to – there's only one of him, and you can't match up him on everybody on the floor. It's going to be tough on them. And Illinois does all the good things – all the things you want to get extra points and push it over. They're a good three-point shooting team. They shoot a decent amount of them. They're really good for the free throw line. They get there a lot. They play fast, better offense than defense, going against a defense that's mm, at best. like I think we're going to get a ton of points out of Illinois, and it's going to fly over here. Yeah, models projecting low 80s for Illinois. Obviously, you never know again with a, with a new gym. Uh, still a slightly early tip, though not quite as early as some of those first games. But when you look at what Illinois has done since the turn of the calendar, exclusively conference games, the only thing they play, they haven't played a non-conference game. They've put up the following numbers, 96, 88, 86, 91, 87, 87, 97, 85, 89, 95, 105, 91, 98, and 93. And those last two numbers were in the Big Ten tournament semifinals and finals. So if you have any thoughts that, hey, tournament time, they're going to be a little bit more measured, a little bit slower paced, looking for the right shot. And a lot of teams do that. Illinois ain't that team. They're still going to continue to push the pace. And and they're all so offensively efficient. They score such a high percentage of their possessions now that especially now that Shannon's back uh, playing on the team, that offense is just so dang good. So there's a really good chance they can they can get to that 90 mark. And that's going to make, like you said, just we just need anything for more heads, anything reasonable from them. And this gets over. Obviously, there are no locks in gambling. That may not happen. It could be a runaway. Uh, but, you know, I like that there's two ways to win this. If Illinois flirts with 100, there's a good chance to win this. Or if Moorhead State hangs in there and scores a bunch of points, it's going to be a score fest. There's there's multiple ways to get the window. It's always a good thing. 4 p.m. Eastern, Oregon and South Carolina. Jake, I'm fascinated for this game. I'm really looking forward to it. South Carolina has been a darling all season. A surprise story that I don't think anybody saw coming. Um, quite the level of success they've had. Oregon... You know, a team that wasn't going to make the tournament if they didn't finish off that incredible run in the Pac-12 term by beating Colorado. Uh, but, you know, give it to Dana Altman, you know, a down year for them in a, in a situation that he usually has things figured out heading into March. Maybe it just took an extra week or two longer than later this year, but it seems like things are starting to fall into place for him. Sometimes he gets them figured out by January, sometimes by February, but it seems like he always gets them figured out in this Oregon team always as well. Heck of a job coaching there. Heck of a job there at South Carolina as well. Two teams that just seem really well coached, a lot of fun. The model's not overly high on either one of them. They might not have the talent that we talk about a team like Michigan State having and nothing against Izzo as a coach there. Uh, but just the way the pieces have fit together, these two teams have really been great stories. Sideline gives Oregon a 58% chance to win. So we're going to take Oregon minus 110. That's a C-grade pick. The B-grade threshold is minus 102. So we're looking for even money 
on Oregon for it to get to a B grade. And if it gets to plus odds, then it would jump to an A grade and our favorite, the wrong team favorite WTF game. So if you can get plus odds on Oregon, even even money would probably get you there from a technicality because even money in Oregon would mean South Carolina's favorite. That'd be the wrong team favorite. So really, it's a C grade at minus 110, but it's not far from an A grade, Jake. I like this one. I like Oregon. I believe in them. I hate to go against South Carolina because they've been a great story, but I just really like what I've seen from this Oregon team. We know they've done it in March in the past. The Altman's got that experience. What's your take on it? Yeah, look, hats off to Lamont Bears. The South Carolina team won 11 games last year, and they won 26 this year. It's incredible. That great, great turnaround. Uh, they scare me because their offense disappears, right? Like when they play solid teams. They put up 80, 80 against Arkansas. Great. Arkansas has been terrible all year. Yeah. Put up only 55 against Auburn. I know Auburn is one of the top teams. Oregon's not that. But like when you're playing good competition in a new gym, the, when the offense disappears and they don't have a true like guy that can say, okay, give me two points right here kind of guy. Um, their best players are shooting 30-ish percent from outside. So it's not – there's not a lot of – Incredible offensive talent. They have to win with their defense. It's going to be tough to do. Oregon seems to be playing very well right now. I mean, whether they want to play slow, fast, doesn't matter. They seem to do just enough to win. But at every time they make their free throws, they're a good rebounding team. They take care of the ball. Everything that you need to do to beat a team like South Carolina, like even in South Carolina's biggest wins, right? Tennessee, Tennessee on the road, 63 points. But Kentucky at home, they put up 79, which I think that pace got driven by Kentucky. I mean, Texas A&M, they barely get to 70. Uh, it took over. They went to overtime against Mississippi State, put up 93. It's just that offense, I'm not sure, is good enough right now, the way it's built, the way it's to score enough to beat this Oregon team. Because Oregon is very solid, and they're going to do what they do, whether that's going to win to a win or loss. They're not going to change anything about how they play, and that's kind of been – to their detriment a little bit. They're not making too many adjustments most of the year, but this seems to have worked out in the tournament because not messing with it has seemed to work out. And I, I think South Carolina won't make won't push the right buttons here to get this win. The total in this game, 132, 132 and a half. Um, to me, this game screams if you want to win, you need to at least flirt with 70. If you get to 70, unless it's like overtime type situation, which is just a whole nother issue. You know, you get to 70, you're going to win this game. If you get to the upper sixties, you got a good chance and the models projecting South Carolina for 65. And I'm like, you, I think the low mid low to mid sixties is all they're going to get. I gives Oregon a good chance to win this because they're the team that's much more likely to get to 70. And if they do that, they're going to be, uh, tough to topple again, assuming we're talking about just a regulation game. Wrapping up the early afternoon slot before we hit the evening games, Nevada and Dayton, another game that should be fantastic. Two relatively close-rated team sidelines get Nevada at a 55% chance of winning. Minus 115 makes for a C grade. Plus 109 gets it to the next tier. And because that would then be a wrong team paper game, same concept as last time, plus 110, we get you to the A grade and the WTF that we love so much. That was, one's a little bit further away. So I don't see that one happening. Oregon being a dime away, you might could sneak that out. But Nevada, I do not think we'll get to plus 110, unfortunately. But Dayton... According to Sideline, the better team, but as you can see, not the highest probability of winning. Why is that? Because the overall ratings have to do with the overall season metrics, whereas the probability of win and the projected spread have a little bit of how the teams have performed recently. And so what that's telling you is that Nevada has been overperforming here the last month relative to expectations. Well, Dayton's been underperforming, and that's why the model says even though that Nevada is the slightly weaker team, they're actually slightly more likely to win. It's going to be strength on strength. Dayton's offense is the better unit. Nevada's defense is the better unit. When Nevada has the ball to be the two weaker units. Jake, what I've liked about Nevada all season long is that they don't make a lot of mistakes. They play the fundamentals. They do all the things right that you need. They're not really flashy. They're not going to hit, you know, crazy threes. They're not going to, you know, really overly impress on offense, but they do what needs to get done. And with that solid defense, we're thinking they could take care of Dayton. What's your take? Uh, I think this is more about Dayton not being as good as what everybody wanted them to be, right? When they went on their big stretch where they won, what, 12, 
straight or something like that. Nothing there was impressive. Right? You lose to Houston by 14, then you beat teams like Youngstown State, Grambling State, Cincinnati, UMass, Rhode Island, LaSalle, those kinds of teams. Then after that, there's not a long streak where they played very good basketball. I know Deron Holmes is probably the best player on the court, but I really like the guards here. Now, Nevada hurt me. I picked them to win the Mountain West, and they go out in their first game. That that sucked. But uh, I'll forgive them here because I think Blackshear and Lucas are very good guards, exactly who you want making the decisions in what should be a close type game. Um, they don't turn the ball over. The one thing they don't do – well at all in offense is rebound, but that's I think by design because they rebound the ball very, very well on the other end of the floor. So it's just they're not really putting that much effort into the offensive glass. They don't shoot that many threes, but when they do, they go in uh, to hitting about thirty six percent on the year. They get to the free throw on the line a ton, and they will make you pay there. Uh, Dayton is a team that's built off of being a very good defensive team and having the threes go in. They get very three-dependent offensively with about, uh, I don't know, 20, 45-ish percent of their attempts being from beyond the arc. And, I mean, they're making 40%, so who can knock them? They're doing well. I just think in a new gym, tournament time, the way things are going to be played out, that's going to be to their detriment. Uh, they – don't foul a lot on defense, so that's going to be interesting to see who, which which one works and the way everything is shifting in basketball as a whole, no matter the level, is everything leans towards the offense. So I think that's going to shade Nevada's way, and I think that's really going to help us out, especially when it comes towards the end of the game. I think Nevada is going to put it away for the free throw line. And, of course, Nevada is much closer to home with this game being played in Salt Lake City than Dayton is. It's <laughs> quite, a, quite a long trip there if that has any effect whatsoever. The other thing I think to point out in this matchup, of course, is that Dayton, coming from the A-10, was a one-bid league, and they ended up getting two because Dayton lost. But Dayton won the conference tournament. They were not getting a second team into the tournament, whereas the Mountain West got six six in and some people would argue that the sixth team was only there because New Mexico won a I would argue that New Mexico's resume was strong enough that they should have made it anyway but even if that's the case fine it was five to one I mean it's still a massive discrepancy there that has been battle tested all season yes they did go out in the first round of the tournament in the Mountain West and that's why I don't necessarily think they're going to be a team that's going to make the final four but they've played just much tougher competition it goes to your point of Dayton being impressive with that nice little winning streak they had but in general, at the by the end of the day, you know Dayton had seven losses, Nevada had seven as well. Nevada played a tougher schedule uh, in conference play, at least, and that's what's been happening here the last couple of months. And so that lends itself to favoring Nevada. That's why they're slight favorites in this one, but we think they should be favored by a little bit more. So we're going to back Nevada at a C grade pick to so the late games here: Oakland and Kentucky. We're going to lay the lumber with Kentucky. 13 and a half is the number. The model says they win by an average of 17. This is obviously a big mismatch. Jake, you never know with Kentucky. They can completely disappear on either side of the ball. They've had a couple of games where their offense just didn't show up, and they got nowhere near the total. They've had a bunch of games that have flown over the total because they've stopped playing defense. All of that, I think, starts to matter come Saturday, and if they make it into next week, it shouldn't matter here because this is such a big mismatch that even if something doesn't go well for them, they should run away the only way they don't, in my opinion, aside from a night where Oakland just is unconscious from three, which is obviously possible, is if it's a game where both their offense disappears and their defense disappears that's possible, but unlikely that both don't show up. As long as they get any reasonable defensive effort, even for Kentucky standards, that's still a better defense than Oakland's offense. But my goodness, when Kentucky has the ball, they have a huge edge. They should be able to name their score. We talk about in each quadrant of games, Thursday afternoon, Thursday night, Friday afternoon, Friday night, there's typically one team, sometimes two, that flirts with 100. Kentucky's got to be one you have your eye on for that prize here Thursday night. Jake, what do you got for us? Yeah, look, Trey Townsend put on a show in the Missouri or the Horizon tournament there, especially the championship. I think he ended up with 40 points. That's not going to happen again. They're, they're, they're just 
uh, not got the talent there to head into, and when Kentucky's so guard heavy with everybody, like I mean, they're bringing lottery picks off the bench from the guard <laughs> standpoint, and Oakland hasn't sniffed anybody that's anywhere near this level of talent. I mean, maybe Michigan State who got about seventeen, or if you want to go as far as Dayton who got about thirty, like it, it's. I mean, they, at least they played Illinois to eleven point game, but that was the, like second game of the year. I just Oakland did well. They played. They deserve the seed. They are. They're a good enough team. They earned their seed. It just it's going to come to a quick halt because Kentucky is crazy. And when I was prepping for this and all that, I didn't realize Rocket Watts is now an o- this Oakland team. Totally didn't know that. They just got started out at Michigan State. I think he transferred to somewhere in the SEC, and then now is at Oakland. And like, and he's not even the best player on this team. I'm <laughs> talking about a guy that fell off. It's a great uh, name, if nothing else. Yeah, I, I just think like, Kentucky's guards and the way this game will go is going to be way too much for Dayton or Oakland here. Yeah, uh, McNeese and Gonzaga. I hate that these two teams are matched up. I love the Smith East team. They might be the best team to come um, from the Southland in quite some time ever. ever, maybe. I mean, that's on the table for sure. Although there were a couple of Southland teams. Uh, that was back back when Sam Houston and SFA were part of the Southland. Of course, now they've both changed conferences uh, that, that made some, you know, had, had, you know, looked okay. I believe uh, maybe... Uh, Abilene Christian might have been part of the South, or they might have been part of the WAC. I can't remember when they beat Texas that year. But either way, none of those teams, I believe, was ranked according to any advanced metrics as high as McNeese State here. Number 68 overall for McNeese. I mean, that is incredible to finish the season that high. Hats off to them. They just haven't played a team like Gonzaga this season. Model says Gonzaga by six and a half. I'm going to lay it with six with Gonzaga. I'm going to zig when everyone else is zagging, pun intended, in yeah. that I think every – yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I think that everyone's talking about this McNeese team, and rightfully so because they are a heck of a story, and I just cannot stress how impressive it is to do this from that conference. But the bottom line is, you know, we had that re- they had that really impressive win against Michigan that looks less impressive by the day. And when you go up against a team like Gonzaga, if the Zags are up by four late, they probably can cover six because of fouls. Five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, probably, based off the seeds of these teams, this would have been a 10-point spread, and the Sharps would have been all over McNeese State, and the public would have been all over Gonzaga. And I would be telling you, run, don't walk, grab 10 points because Gonzaga could easily win this by six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 and push. Today, though, Gonzaga's a little played out. Everyone's tired of talking about them. It's more hip and cool to talk about how Gonzaga's not that good this year, how this is one of the weaker Gonzaga teams we've seen. McNeese State is the hip team, and it's like it completely swung, and now I think there's actually some value backing them here I wish this was a much higher number and we could take McNeese State, but if it's going to be six, I think Gonzaga is the way you got to go. Jake, what do you got for us? Yeah, if if I have to play something here, I guess I'll lay the points with Gonzaga. I'm not thrilled about it. Uh, I wish these teams were playing each other too, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, look, not to knock McNeese State in the turnaround they had, winning 30 games in a year, very impressive, but what four of those are against Division two teams, and one of those is Mississippi University for women. Like, I'm not sure that should count as a as a very good win. <laughs> I mean, they did only allow 23 points, but still, uh, just mm. either way, uh, Mississippi State where they struggle from the free throw line, shooting sub 70. percent What they do best is they force turnovers and keep you off the three point arc. Gonzaga's not going to turn the ball over enough, and they don't really care about the three-point arc that much, and they're a decent three-point shooting team. They just don't care the height and on all the positions that's going to give uh, McNeese State trouble. Shonda Wells is the best 
player on Mini State and very, very good. But I mean, he's six foot. That's shorter than almost everybody on Gonzaga's roster that even the play guards. So, I mean, like, well, Nimhart's right at six foot, but then the backup six two. They're just giving away height everywhere you go. You've got a guy like Graham Ike who people forgot because he was hurt and didn't play last year. And then he goes out to Gonzaga, and Gonzaga wasn't the powerhouse that they were, so they're not on TV every night. He is one of the best back-to-the-bucket big men out yeah. there. If there wasn't – like if, if he played on the East Coast where everybody could watch him, there would be a lot more chatter about him. He's a very good – he's got a good jump shot. He can play. He can do every move. He handles the ball, passes it well. Uh, Nimhard, incredible point guard. Uh, Wat- Watson seems to have picked it up the last couple of games. Uh, I don't think Gonzaga is going to do, do this. I think they're going to cover. I'm just not excited about it. Uh, you mentioned EK. He absolutely dominated that win that Gonzaga had uh, towards the, the – I guess it was the last weekend of the regular season against St. Mary's. And that St. Mary's defense can be nasty. And they did a better job of containing him in the second game, mainly because they got EK into foul trouble. I mean, that's really got to be McNeese's game plan to somehow get EK into foul trouble. The problem is, like you said, they just don't really have the size to match up. And that really says to me, if you're Gonzaga and they've got a smart coach over there, just don't do anything stupid here. You're only favored by six, and the model only says six and a half. It's not like you should win this game by 20. Just feed the big man and let him eat because he should be able to dominate McNeese State down low. This is going to be a trendy upset pick. I'm not saying it can't happen. McNeese State could absolutely pull the upset. I'm just saying if you're if, if you're setting the line here at six, I think the number needs to be higher before the dog really starts to have a little bit of life. 7.35 p.m. Eastern. South Dakota State and Iowa State, speaking of nasty defense here, uh, Iowa State, second best in the country. We're going to go under 134, a B-grade pick. I really like B-grade unders here in the tournament, uh, everyone that we can grab, because these first couple of days, we talk a lot about the new gym. By Saturday, some of they've played here. Before even by the second half, they've played there. So you'll start to see a little bit of an uptick in scoring, but – uh, this could be a real sleepy first half uh, with measured pace from both sides. Either one of these teams wants to push at all and a real sleepy second half because we can see Iowa State can just completely choke hold a game. We saw what Iowa State just did to Houston and not to say that Houston is the best offense in the world, but they got a better offense at South Dakota State. This game could be very low scoring, ugly and boring. We've seen Iowa State play in several media game like this over the years where uh, this level of defense and this pace, you know, where they, they win a game 55 to 40 or something. And this game is possible to do that. B grade under 134 model says 129. Jake, what do you got? Yeah, just ooh, 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 ooh. I'm not sure what South Dakota State's going to do, be, be able to do. I mean, they're going to have to ask permission from Iowa State for every bounce of the ball. And it's unfortunate for them because it's going to look nasty. It's going to get out, out of hand early. There's nothing South Dakota State's going to be able to do. I mean, they just had a game a couple games ago that went St. Thomas, St. Thomas where they went 59 to 40. They won 59 to 49. I mean, I think – Scoring 49 here would be a victory for them because I don't think Iowa State's going to let them breathe. They, they're they angry about the one seed that rightfully so, in my opinion, should have been theirs, not North Carolina's. Uh, and they're going to come out with the proof point. They're going to get out, get ahead early, and they're going to go way ahead, and then they're going to rest like most smart coaches do. Don't leave your guys out there and risk – landing on a guy's foot or the basketball or tripping over a bleacher somewhere or something stupid. After. Or getting a ball thrown at you while you're celebrating at the, with two seconds to go at the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you did an unnecessary windmill. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. There's all sorts of crazy things that happen. Uh, but so they're going to do that. South Dakota state still the <laughs> backup players for Iowa state who have been practicing all year against this defense yeah. are going to play the same defense. It's not yeah. like the defensive intensity is going to drop off. They're right. going to play the same defense. They're going to – And then just – except, except wait 27 off. seconds into the shot clock before they shoot at that point. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so it's way less points to score. Uh, I would say sub, sub 70% for the free throw line. Not a ton of extra points coming there. I think we're going to, wait, we're going to go way under here. 
I I love Iowa State. I love Iowa State fans. If you're an Iowa State fan out there, I love you. Um, but I have to say, you talk about a chip on the shoulder. Iowa State fans live with a chip on their shoulder. It's just like, I think Iowa fans do too. I think it's like something about being from that state. I don't know what it is. Everyone there is like the nicest people in the world. But there's I, every Iowa State fan, it's just they've got a chip on their shoulder. And I don't know if it's part of the fact that they were kind of like, you know, drug up from the Big 8 into the Big 12 and all the years that they struggled and they've always been little brother to – you know, somebody in football in the conference, you know, for, for so many years, Nebraska, right. And, and, you know, in, in basketball to Kansas, and they've always felt disrespected and, and, and maybe they have a case uh, of being disrespected, but they always have a chip on the shoulder, which is great for us betters because we know that Iowa state, when they, when they have a situation where you can say that they want something and they feel disrespected, I mean, they go out and get it. And so uh, I, like I said, I love it. It's great. Uh, it seems uh you know, like a great team uh, to ride here. I wish they were in an easier region uh, than the one they got put in, but a, a team that that really wants to go out there and prove uh, just how good they are. And they are really a good team, easily a top 10 team by any, uh, you know, definition or metric. Uh, Sideline's got them at number eight right now, but it's, it's really rounding error to get them up to number four. There's not a lot of room between uh, where they are in number four. So a fantastic team. We think they're just going to choke this game out. Under 134 is the B-grade pick for that one. There's one other game at this time slot. That'll be Texas. Uh, will probably be the first one of this time slot. They will be playing TBD as of this point. It'll be Colorado State uh, or Virginia. And so we can't obviously talk about that one. But we can talk about all four games to wrap us up. Jake here, Tennessee Volunteers will be playing St. Peter's. Uh, Tennessee's playing faster than ever this year. This is maybe one of the fastest Rick Barnes teams we've ever seen, but they still play really good defense. We talk a lot about Houston's defense, Iowa State's defense, Tennessee's defense slots in third. St. Peter's new coach, all those guys transferred from that incredible run they had. It seems like I'm not sure if there's anybody left there, but it's the same style. No offense, all defense, slow pace. It's like a completely new chapter, but it is the same book. We're going to go under 129, B-plus grade, almost ekes into an A grade. Another good under for us here, hopefully to wrap up Thursday as the model's projecting low 120s. Jake, I can't figure out why this number's so high, but you like the under here as well. I think the books and everybody's valued pace way too much. Tennessee is playing faster, but I mean, their offense isn't infallible. Like <laughs> we've seen it not show up many yeah. times this year. Uh, I mean, just in two in two of the last three games, they've scored less than sixty points. I know those are against a lot better competition, but I mean, at the same time, in those games, their defense. Always travels. That's one thing good about Rick Barnes. You know what that defense is going to do. Uh, St. Peter's, heck of a run to win the tournament. That they did well. Took all everything. It took Fairfield just going oh for the world from three, um, and not even close. I mean, they were wide. There, I can remember watching that game, and there was one possession where they had five threes in the same possession, and three of them either hit the side of the backboard or airballed. Like, wow. It's just wow. what what happened there. St. Like Peter shoots sub 50% on the year inside the arc. They turn the ball over almost 20% of the time. Uh, they're not good offense. I have a hard time <laughs> seeing how they score above 50 points. <laughs> Excuse me. Here, uh, it's going to be tough. Tennessee's defense is going to lock them down. Then they're going to get it way ahead and – just drain the life, four corners offense. Um, the only fun thing that's going to be watched is to see which which of Zakai Ziegler's parents, what, what jersey they're wearing, how they found a St. Peter's Tennessee split, or if they just say, That'll have to be Zakai, it's Zakai, it, Yeah, it's Zakai's turn. Amari, you're just a freshman. We'll get to you later. Kind of thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, but that's about the only interesting part of this game. 
Yeah, we think it'll probably be a little bit of a runaway and uh, kind of lather, the rinse, repeat what we had just said in the previous game with Iowa State. Uh, Models got this Tennessee by 19 and a half. And so it's just a, a massive mismatch. But uh, to your point, Tennessee's a team, we played a lot of overs on early on in the season, middle of the season, kind of cooled on their overs with one exception. And we went over with them in that regular season finale against Kentucky that missed by one basket. Uh, but Tennessee finished the season by going under in seven of their last eight games, which completely changed the trajectory of how you view them from a total standpoint from a team that early on in the season was playing efficient offense. The defense was great, just not elite. Pace was a little bit faster, but it seems like over the last month or so, they're kind of starting to get a little bit more into the old normal Rick Barnes team where the offense has taken a little bit of a step back. But the good news for them, the defense has taken a little bit of a step up in that getting that clear number three ranking uh, and the pace slowing down just a little bit from where they were maybe a little bit faster early on. And if that trend continues, that's kind of why the model is really liking this under thinking that what they've done here in the last month is going to be a little bit more predictive here going forward and that they're going to play that traditional Rick Barnes style of basketball, especially now that March is here. And so we like the under here, one of the stronger plays of the first day. But to the strongest play that we have, 9.40 p.m. Eastern, NC State and Texas Tech. NC State plus 180, A grade play. Why it's the wrong team favored game in that Tech is massive favorites, but the model says – really coin toss this game up. And you can see on screen there, the model has Tech as the 29th best team and NC State as the 51st best team. But that is, again, overall for the full season. When you look at how these teams have played down the stretch, what NC State has done has been pretty impressive. They're really playing their best basketball at the right time. And that's not to take anything away from Tech. We mentioned them earlier. They have an incredibly efficient offense. But with what NC State did to Duke and then Virginia, who plays just a crazy different style, and then to North Carolina, playing Tech shouldn't feel that difficult. This Tech team has had some highs and lows here lately. I'm not saying NC State wins this game. I'm saying I don't know what happens. Plus 180 is fantastic value. You can be a little more conservative and take the points if you want. But given that it's a coin toss, folks, if you could sign me up at the roulette table and give me plus 180 on red or black, I would take it every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Jake, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I love it because the odds, I love the way uh, NC State's playing right now. DJ Burns is fantastic. And he's funny to watch. He's a like he looks like a class clown kind of guy out there. He doesn't fit your if you were to describe a basketball player, especially in today's game, you describe the complete opposite of DJ Burns. Yeah. You're not him tall, like he very athletic, can shoot the ball from deep. Uh, I, he hit a three, I think, in the North Carolina game, which was his first three ever. That's hilarious, and it looked good, which was wild. Uh, but I mean, he's the complete opposite of what you designed him to play. DJ Horn, great fun to watch when he gets going. Gets himself in foul trouble and takes himself out of the game too much. Uh, otherwise, he'd be a more well-known name. Look, I, I'm excited to watch Pop Isaacs. I think this will be a fun game. I think I'm interested to see what Pop Isaacs uh, does with NC State. I think uh, Kevin Keats is going to have a great game plan against him and get it figured out. The teams uh, Tech has struggled with this year are – teams that are very physical, right? Like Houston plays a very physical defense and Iowa State. Like yeah, Iowa UCF. State. Baylor Baylor even UCF, Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Uh Texas kind of the exception, I guess. They're not the most physical team in the world, but they're a solid team and Villanova in the non conference. They got yeah. smoked by Villanova. Uh, yeah. Getting Villanova to put up eighty five is impressive yeah. from your defense. But uh they get a little three dependent that can really hurt in these tournament games. New gym, new everything, a little bit of jitters. You start off cold sometimes. When you start off cold, then some guys shrink away and they just decide, I can't shoot tonight. So I start passing. Mm -hmm. That's going to play right into take, uh, NC State's hands. Um, it's going to give them the ball more. They do not turn the ball over. They're top 10 in the nation at turnover percentage. It's rare that they turn it over. It's going to be very tough for Texas Tech to get that going. They rebound the ball well, even with when DJ Burns isn't out there. Uh, Diara is a rebounding machine and does very well. 
like it's just going to be a fantastic game to watch. Fun. I love getting almost two X on my money here. I'm going to take NC State all day. And and of course, you know, you mentioned the tech struggles. And when you look through their schedule, it's just been, you know, they had that real hot streak in December to close out non conference when they didn't play anybody. Uh, and then they started off conference, you know, so strong. But it's just been so much up and down with, you know, you know, they beat BYU at home. It was good. But then they went on a three game losing streak where they lost to TC, lost at home to Cincinnati. That was really bad. Then lost at Baylor. You know, then they beat Kansas at home, but then they lost to Iowa State. They beat TCU at home and they lost at UCF, lost to Texas. Like just so much up and down. You didn't really know what you were going to get from them. And that it was even embodied in the tournament where they couldn't miss against BYU and put up 81 points. And then they got throttled by Houston in a game where, you know, the rebound discrepancy of that game was just something to behold. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite uh, as stark as the rebounding differential um, in that game. But, you know, they've been kind of up and down all season. When you look at NC State, when you really look under the hood, even beyond this five-game winning streak in the conference play, uh, the conference tournament, when you go back to the rest of the season, yes, they had a bunch of losses. But when you look at them, there's really only one or two that I can think of in here in recent in the recent games that's – you know, a concern, right? When you go back to mid-February, they won on the road at Clemson. That's a pretty good win. The really concerning one probably was the home loss to Syracuse, but that was back in late February that they took care of business against BC. And then they lost their last four regular season games, but two of three of the four were road games. One of them was Duke. One of them was North Carolina. They were competitive in all of them except for the Duke game. And then, of course, they exacted their revenge. It's pretty excusable, right? We're not saying that NC State is a team that we think is going to win the tournament, though. Nobody would have thought they would have won the ACC tournament. But it's kind of reasonable situations. This isn't a road game for them. If this was in Lubbock, it would be a little bit of a different story. And I wouldn't trust them whatsoever. But we saw them go on a neutral court uh, last week and take care of teams that are much better than Tech. Uh, and Tech, you know, if you get good Tech, they're really good. And if you don't, they're not. And that's, I think, the point. If this was even money both ways... I don't really think I'd, I'd love it, but the plus 180 is what makes this too, you know, so good here is not to say that NC State's guaranteed to win. It's just saying it's a pretty coin tossy type game. If we don't get good tech, NC State's got a great chance to win this. So give me the plus 180. It is our eight grade play for Thursday. And we've got two more games to cover. One of them here, Samford and Kansas. The big question on everybody's lips is about Kansas and their two Star players, McCuller and Dickinson, both of them listed officially as questionable. One of them looks a little bit more likely to play than the other. But Kansas' sixth best player, according to Sideline, is below college basketball average. And that's just incredible. I cannot believe that Bill Self let him get let himself get into that situation for a team of the pedigree of Kansas. They just have absolutely zero depth. If neither one of those guys play, is a very different story than if one of them plays, is a very different story than if both of them play. Right now, we've got them both as questionable, which means they both get some minutes. And so we're kind of relying a little bit on that depth. This is the projection that's going to change the most. Everyone, you will get a day of projection over on Dub Club. And this number, Kansas by seven and a half, could easily go up to double digits or could easily drop down to four or five. This Samford team is pretty good. As you can see, they're ranked number 77 overall on the strength of their really good offense. Kansas has played good defense, but if those two stars are not there, they are really going to struggle to score. We're going to take Samford plus seven and a half. Model says seven and a half, so this one's pretty spot on. But if I'm going to lock something in right now, give me all the points because I don't really know what to make of Kansas. They have no depth. I don't know if those guys are playing. If this game, if Kansas gets up 10 late, neither one of them is going to be in the game because there's no point in a re-injury situation. So the back door is going to be wide open. There's a lot of ways Sanford can cover this, but definitely one you might want to keep an eye on. Again, the update will come day of. And if needed, the update will come middle of the day, later in the day, once we know more information, because the most important injury news of the tournament is about their two stars. Jake, tell us more. Yeah, like, if Kansas is injured, there's no way. I think they lose this game. If both those guys don't play, I think they yeah. drop it. Like, like, and I thought the question coming in was, with a core, core, which one's his first name, which one's his last name? Like, Fair. you know, I thought that Fair. was the question Fair. everybody's wondering. Uh, but maybe that's just me. Uh, but like Sanford, top 10 three point shooting team out, out there. They're shooting almost 40%. 
Um, very high effective field goal percentage, almost 57%. Uh, they play fast. That is going to be very tough because they're going to get to the line. Uh, Kansas is thin, even if both those guys play. If they should get into foul trouble, things are in trouble. Uh, like the, Kansas is in big trouble. This is a nightmare matchup if I'm Kansas. This is the of the 13 seeds. This is the one you did not want to see uh, based on how they play, how they're playing coming in. I mean, even with Dickinson and McCuller playing in full strength, this Kansas team wasn't good, wasn't that good, right? Like the, the wins they have away from their away from Fog Allen aren't impressive. I, mm-hmm. I know they got UConn at Fog Allen, but like I said, that's at home. You're not going to get those refs. That whistle's not going to be there. You're not going to be that comfortable shooting. I mean, you're looking at the team that lost to UCF and West Virginia on the road. It gave up 91 points to West Virginia. Uh, I mean, Houston absolutely throttled them too. Uh, the last game with both those guys out, like it's man, these injuries are tough. Bill Self has got his work cut out for him in this one, and I can't wait. Love getting seven and a half, but man, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna take Stanford on the money line because I know that price is going to, I'm gonna lose it uh, as soon as it's announced that one or both of those guys are not playing. Yeah, that's the real question here is I don't know exactly how the market's treating this game. All I can do is say what sideline says and where sideline is going to go with the injury news. It's either going to go up or down because it's kind of splitting the difference. That's what I would expect the market to do, but I don't actually know what's baked in, how much they're expecting those guys to play or not. So then the news, sometimes the injury news comes out and you won't see a number move at all. That's just a clear indication that the injury was already baked and everybody was assuming that. I'm not really sure about what will happen here, but there's definitely room for this number to move one way or the other. I just don't know which way it would move with what news and what everybody else is expecting. Uh, My hunch is we get one of them uh, here on this first game and not the other one, and that would make this line be pretty similar because right now I'm giving them each kind of half credit. And so if one plays and one doesn't, that's where we'll be here. Where Kansas is definitely the better team, but an upset could happen, especially like you said, the way Sanford shoots the three ball recipe you want for an upset is to get hot from three so definitely worth a little bit of a sprinkle on the money line here uh, especially if kansas isn't completely healthy even if they are as you mentioned they could have if they have any foul trouble whatsoever this team just doesn't have depth uh to withstand anything happening uh, if they can keep everybody healthy and that's of course um out of foul trouble they can do that at home because they notoriously get the edge from the big 12 refs uh but you know we literally will not be in Kansas anymore on that one. Had to had to get that one in too. Uh, wrapping us up here Thursday night, the late game, Drake and Washington State. Strength on strength, weakness on weakness. Drake, the better offense. Washington State, the better defense. The weaker of the two units will be the opposite of that Washington State when they have the ball against Drake's defense. Next to each other in the rankings, these two teams are Drake, number 56, Washington State, number 55. Models got it pretty coin toss. We're going to take Drake on this one, minus 110. This is just a coin flip. Who the heck knows what's going to happen on it? But you have to like the way Drake's played to wrap up the season versus Washington State when you look at their end of the season was a little bit more up and down. You could argue that the competition was a little bit tougher for Washington State. Uh, But the way they bowed out in the conference tournament just doesn't give me a ton of faith going into this one. I would have liked to have seen them beat Colorado and get to play Oregon for the conference title. would have given me more faith in them in this matchup. Uh, But the way they fell down to Colorado and just couldn't get over the hump, this Drake offense could do the same thing to them. If they get up early, Washington State's going to have a hard time coming back. They can fight all they want, but I'm not sure they'll be able to get over the hump. Just like the way Drake's playing of late, so we're going to take them in what's, again, really a coin toss type game. So a situation where we'd really want Drake at plus odds if you can get it. Uh, And a game where if we could get Washington State at plus 120, we would love that as well. But right now with both sides being at minus 110, we're going to lean towards Drake. But this is one where price and and or the number of points you could get would matter because I don't really know what's going to happen to wrap us up. Should be a good nightcap for us, Jake. What's your take? Look, it's a great way to end the game, end the day because it's going to be an incredible game, going to be tight. These teams are incredibly even. Uh, <laughs> both do things way differently. Washington State doesn't care about the three ball. Drake likes it. Uh, Miles Rice from Washington State, that's a name you're going to want to know. Very, very good player. 
uh, as a freshman. He's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and then Tucker from, I don't know how to say his last name, from Drake is an incredible uh, player, junior. I love the way Drake's playing right now. I think Washington State is a very solid team. You saw from that like mid, mid to late January to like end of February, they went on a run, did very well, uh, then dropped one to Arizona State and Washington, and then Washington at the end of the year, weird. But uh, the free throw line is going to get to them and not being able to force turnovers this is going to hurt. So I lean Drake, but I'm waiting to play this so I see one get some plus odds, then back in that one because I think that's the right way to handle this game because this is, to me, the 50-50 game of the day. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of many coin toss type first round games we'll get between uh, the opening round uh, Tuesday, all four first games, the two Tuesday, the two Wednesday, a handful here Thursday and Friday. There's a handful of these coin toss type games. And so really the price matters, folks. Don't get price um, blind to price just because we're wrapping up the season. Remember, we don't want to lose our principles there. So many of you already know this and many of you heard me talk about this, but just because the season's ending and there's fewer and fewer games, we still want to be thinking about the price. It's still real easy to think about because there are still enough games that if you end up taking a bunch of teams at minus 110 and winning 50% of them, it's a very different world than if you go 50% taking teams plus 110. Right, that's a very different world. There are enough games for it to still matter. So keep that price in mind. And I love what you're saying there. If we could get plus odds on either one of these teams, I'd rather have plus odds on Drake because the model says 51 to 49. But honestly, I don't care enough. If it was plus 110, I'd take plus 110 on either side and move on because I'm getting plus money in a game that I don't know what's going to happen. It should be a fantastic one. Uh, Jake, I did want to wrap up with uh, Mississippi University for Women. That's a real thing, and I did not know that. And more importantly, they have a full slate of men's athletics. They have a baseball team. I didn't know this. I was a professor for five years at Texas Women's University. We did have male students there made up about 10-ish percent of the student body population, but there were no male sports. The only athletic teams were uh, women's sports. So uh, yeah, apparently, you know, the, apparently they we could have started up a baseball team there. I, I guess I don't know. The, I mean, that's it's just wild to me to think they have a full slate. Like, update your name, just update yeah. your name because clearly you're not just for women right now. Clearly, clearly they are for for more than just women at this point. So yes. you're good for them for being inclusive. Put, put a plus know. at the end of it. Women plus. Women, women plus. Exactly. We just count everybody. It doesn't. You know, we, yeah. we don't. We don't really care. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think they could be Mississippi University because, I, you know, at that point, you know, you, you named, yeah. you know, so you have to come up with something else. It was, uh, you know, Texas State with the other direction. If you're from Texas, uh, here where I'm originally from, right, they were Southwest Texas State. They actually just dropped the Southwest. I don't know if you if y'all know this, people, uh, because now they're just known as Texas State. But back when they were a smaller school back in D2 or whatever, they were Southwest Texas State. And as they changed up, they just dropped the Southwest. They just became Texas State. So sometimes you can just drop a part of your name and it. it Work out, <laughs> work out just fine for you. Again, remember Dub Club has your NIT, your CBI, and your CIT is back this year. After I don't know how many of your hiatus they weren't around last year, uh, so we've got all of that over on Dub Club. We'll have updated projections, picks on the games involving uh, the two that we could not cover here on show. Baseball right around the corner. A lot of reasons to sign up for Dub Club, but Jake. We've got a lot of content here this week for people in their college basketball, but do you have any parting words for people as this show comes to a close? Look, I'm just sad that the NIT is dying, right? It's, that was always fun to watch. It was a good tournament to watch, especially if your team was like borderline good and you're like playing well in the NIT, gave you hope for the next year. Hope for next year, yeah. It, but, man, nobody seems to want to play it. No. They've got to move the portal entry date. I think it's the only way you save. Yeah, like this. yeah, I, uh, I agree. But, having having it now is a death sentence for so many teams and programs. You need to do it after. Do it afterwards, and then it becomes a showcase your abilities for that sort of thing. As opposed to if you, if you do it now and everybody's moving around ahead of time, you don't want to get hurt for 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 what's happening next year. But if you if you push it later. 
it, it, it can't hurt, I guess. I, yeah, I don't know. It's just sad. Like the fact that it moved out of Madison Square Garden was also sad. Uh, man, it just stinks. I like watching good, fun basketball. It was always fun to watch. Who was it to beat Kentucky a handful of years ago and stormed the court there? Bob, Bob <laughs> Morris. Yeah, like I love like you get great stories like that, and those are just not going to be there anymore. It's just yeah, and they got to they got to host because Kentucky didn't want to host the first one. They didn't put a bid in it yeah. for it because they didn't they didn't want to host it. They didn't think they were going to be there or whatever it was, and so uh, yeah. they put the game at Robert Morris, who won, and of course uh, Storm the Court was a legendary mm -hmm. one for them. All right, as always, everyone, best of luck. Outro video with some slides. To make sure you remember our betting principles around these parts, and we will see y'all soon for the Friday first round games.